things of where like, okay, I can see where We'll call this meeting back to order and uh, have the Pledge of Allegiance. It's time before we start the Pledge of Allegiance, if our pledgers can uh, introduce themselves, who they are, and then uh, prepare to start. I'm Tegan. And I'm Evan. And we attend Meadows Elementary. And we attend Meadows Elementary. Okay, hand on your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You did such an awesome job. You look like some of our staff. Do your parents work for the district? 
You do. And who are your parents and what schools do they work at? It's Corey Anderson and Roman Ruiz. And Meadows Elementary. And Meadows at, at Meadows Elementary. And information technology. And information at technology. You all did an awesome job. Thank you so much. That's a, some of the best pledges I've heard all day. Uh, I don't know if any board members have any uh, comment that they'd like to make for our two Meadows Elementary students. I love your shirts. They're both Meadows shirts, right? Is that right? Yes. So what grades did you say you were in? Third. You're both in third? We're twins. Didn't we have twins last time too? We did. You're the second set of twins we've had this in the past uh, two two weeks. So, so what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a cheerleader. A cheerleader? That's good. And how about you, Evan? Um, I want to be a teacher. Oh, great. <laughs> what do you want to teach? Elementary, middle, high school, college? Um, fourth. Fourth grade? That's great. We'll have a job for you. We'll put, have you interview here soon, I'm sure. Evan. Any other questions for Evan or Tegan? Mrs. Bully. Well, you would be welcome as an educator. I know that you've been coming to uh, professional developments since you were two weeks old, I believe. <laughs> I remember your mother bringing you to one of her developments when she was coming back. So you will be well prepared. So we look forward for you. <laughs> Start them early. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your skills. Have a good evening. Go to your you work. too. <laughs>
no matter what, when you're thinking of students who deserve recognition, he's definitely one that like you automatically think of because he's so involved. Congratulations, sweetheart. We're proud of you. I have not yet decided what school I will be going to. Hopefully it will be somewhere down in Texas. A uh, really good dream of mine to travel down there. But uh, study architecture is my goal to, uh, to achieve after high school. Guy here is energetic, he's a scholar athlete, he's very generous with his time, and he's one of those rare leaders who does not have to shout to be heard. My biggest piece of advice would be to continue with his advocating. Not to fear bothering people, but to continue to advocate for himself and keep going, you know, even if it, they're people he doesn't know, just to put himself out there. And with the video, we're going to turn it over to uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Buckendorf and Ms. Watson, if there are any final comments you want to say very briefly as we turn it over to Yahir. Yahir, I do want to say that these several years have gone by fast. I remember the picture that I saw on the screen. You were out of town and you not only are president of the Key Club, but you started the Key Club, if I remember correctly, three or four years ago. So we are so incredibly proud of you. Turn it over to Ms. Watson and Mr. Buckendorf. As we prepare to pull them up, at this time, I know that Evan is also, uh, I said Evan from the person that just did the pledge. He's still in my mind, the twins. I know that Yahir is on the screen, so we'll go ahead and pull Yahir on up and then uh, allow for board members to ask him questions. And Yahir, if there are some other comments you'd like to make, now is the time for that as well. Does anyone have any questions for Yahir? Go ahead, Mr. Munoz. Uh, hi, my name is Yahiro Maurice. I'm a senior at Highland Park High School, and I guess I'm senior of the month this year. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, congratulations from, from all of us here. Uh, it's a recognition that's well-deserved, I'm sure. I had questions about, tell me more about what is Key Club, and uh, two, the second question was, what got you interested in architecture? Uh, so Key Club is a volunteer organization that is, it's an inter international organization, actually. Uh, the charter for Highland Park started, I believe, like two or three years right before I got there. So as a freshman, it was already set in, but I did uh, get a quick interest to, into it uh, my freshman year. Um, basically, we, we volunteer in the community in any way we can. We've done... Uh, campus uh, cleanups in the past. We've done food drives with harvesters, uh, clothes drives, stuff like that. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, and you have two guests there next to you. Who, who are they? Uh, yeah, this is my mom. Say hi. Hello. And this is my dad over here. Hi. Uh, my siblings are in their rooms right now, but uh, they're in the house too. Well, uh, to your, your parents, uh, you know, los, uh, los hijos son un reflejo de sus papás, entonces feliz, este es un or orgullo, me imagino, para ustedes y felicidades. Uh, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. So, Dr. Anderson, I'm unmuted now. I just wanted to say a couple of things. So, so Yahir is obviously very modest, as you can tell. Not only does he do, you know, varsity soccer, he's participated in the Key Club and is the president of that, but he also is on the yearbook staff. He's participated in Scholars Bowl, Model UN, AP and college courses. Um, he's attended Washburn Tech and, and did the, the welding program there. And all of this while maintaining, you know, a wonderful GPA, of, you know, at the top of his class or towards the top of his class. And, you know, all of that as well, he served, he's doing service projects quite frequently. So that's just kind of the way that I've been introduced to Yahir. Um, just as a, a kid that's very outgoing and just cares about others and the advancement of not only his school 
and his, his classmates, but also the whole Topeka community. So we're very proud to have, have uh, yeah, here as the TPS student of the month. And I'd just like to thank the board and Dr. Anderson for having us tonight and letting us celebrate you here as, as the student of the month. Are there other questions for you here? Uh, Reverend Williams. Uh, congratulations on being recognized as senior of the month. Uh, I will say, you know, architecture is a very noble profession and I understand your interest in going to Texas, but there is a fantastic architectural program about 57 miles northwest of Topeka by the name of Kansas State University. <laughs> Highly recommended. <laughs> yeah, um, Texas isn't my only, uh, my only idea for uh, university. It's just that for like the past four or five years, I've like always had dreams to travel down there. So that is my top pick, but if I don't get into there, I'm definitely applying at KU and K-State for the architecture programs there. Remember I said, 57 miles northwest <laughs> of Topeka. <laughs> yeah, I hear this. Um, congratulations on being selected of senior of the, of the month. The video that they showed was was one of the best I've seen and, and since we've been doing this. I think Ms. Watson and the others' description of you as somebody who cares about everybody at your school, is approachable, outgoing, um, really are great. Uh, personality traits and attributes to have in anybody and they'll serve you well throughout the rest of your life. So I hope you can continue to, to carry that forward as you pursue your, your architectural career, possibly 57 miles northwest of here at Kansas State University. I, I did want to, I did want to ask you here a couple more questions. So we, I know we had talked earlier about um, some of the, some of the teachers that had influenced them or educators that had influenced them and um, also some of his best memories of, of school. So I wanted him to be able to share those too, if he would. Uh, so I've definitely had uh, a lot of teachers over the years that have influenced me and been role, uh, role models to me. Uh, the first one probably uh, probably being my kindergarten teacher, Ms. Saunders, who instilled a, a good discipline in me and a good uh, worth that, uh, work ethic. Uh, Right after that would probably be Mr. Morass because he's guided me uh, all four years of high school, uh, especially when I didn't know that many people. He just guided me along the path to continue uh, through the right classes, if you will. Then good memories that I've had of uh, Highland Park, it would probably uh, also be with Mr. Morass. He does like to take us on trips. I remember, I think it was my freshman year of high school, we went to Wichita for Model UN. And on the way back, we were like kind of on the back roads of a highway. And I remember the van broke down for a little bit and we weren't sure if we were actually gonna get back to Topeka on time or not, but we did make it. We were good, uh, nervous for a good minute though. Well, that's great. Yeah, here. Thank you for your um, leadership at Highland Park High School, and good luck to you in your future. Can I say one thing? Felicidades y lo mereces este premio. Hablas español, Yair? Sí, sí, hablo español. Okay, I, I thought so. So that's wonderful. Your bilingual skills, also. That's so great that you've maintained your English and your Spanish equally. Well, I don't know if it's equally, but, but suficiente throughout the years, and that will serve you really well in life. So, Thank felicidades you. otra vez. Thank yes, mis padres también. Felicidades. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias. So as we conclude our Senior of the Month, yeah, here just as a side item as we close this piece out, Reverend Williams is a retired architect who happened to attend K-State. Therefore, that is why he's encouraging that. Yeah, here since you are right here in Topeka Public Schools and right down the street from uh, the central office, I would encourage as a Highland Park uh, student, uh, perhaps mentoring if that would be something that you'd have an interest in, that perhaps Reverend Williams uh, could be a mentor to talk about architecture and maybe even discuss uh, 
K-State and other matters that you might want to discuss as a future architect. Does that sound like something of interest that we can uh, sign him as your mentor? Every senior gets a mentor, at least that started a few years back. And so if you would like to have Reverend w Williams and Reverend Williams, if you, he's nodding that he would be honored. So uh, yeah, here this evening, it sounds like you might've just gained a mentor. Does that sound satisfactory to have a uh, former architect as one of your mentor mentors this year? Yeah, definitely. That sounds great. That's excellent. So we're excited for you. Again, congratulations. And thank you to uh, all of the family members who've helped him get to this point. We're excited for you. All right, as we continue with our highlights this evening, it is National uh, uh, Principals Month. And so we'll be celebrating our principals this evening. To ha We have with us both the president of the Principals Association, Mr. Hare uh, from Jardine, and we have uh, Nicole Johnson, who had the students that did the, uh, who had students from her school that uh, performed at the pledge. The two of them are gonna share the proclamation. When they're done with that, they also will be sharing a little bit about how their first uh, week of school has gone in Ms. Johnson's case with all students uh, and in Mr. Hare's case with sixth graders. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for uh, letting Ms. Johnson and I represent such a fine group of dedicated individuals. We are pretty blessed to be in our district and pretty blessed to be a part of such a great principal crew. So um, we are going to start and we'll read the proclamation together. Um, so proclamation of Topeka United Schools District number 501, National Principals Month, October 2020. Whereas a principal's leadership is a crucial element needed to ensure the academic success of Topeka Public School students and Whereas school principals and assistant principals are responsible for the day-to-day -day operation of their school, which includes supporting students as learners, overseeing the effective implementation of student-centered programs, building meaningful relationships with students, families, teachers, community partners, and others, and nurturing a student-focused school culture, and... Whereas school principals and assistant principals are instructional leaders, working with teachers to establish high expectations for all students and promote the use of effective and appropriate classroom practices. And whereas principals and assistant principals work diligently to create a positive school climate that is inviting the students, families, and the community, as well as provide a safe and supportive environment where students learn, grow, and achieve now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education of Unified School District 501, Topeka, Kansas, does proclaim October 2020 as National Principals Month. The Board encourages citizens to join in the celebration of National Principals Month by thanking all school administrators for the care and concern they show for our children. October 2020 is National Principals Month. And be it further resolved that a copy of this proclamation be included in the minutes of the Board of Education meeting, October 1, 2020. In witness whereof, we, the staff of Topeka United School District number 501, do hereby affix the signature of our superintendent and the official seal of the Board of Education this 1st of October of 2020. Mr. Hare and I would list, just like to take a second and thank the board for this proclamation and the ongoing support that all Topeka Public Schools administrators receive. We are very grateful to be a part of a school district with a board of education that values what we do and supports us in putting children first. You did an awesome job. Thank you both. All right, with that, while we uh, have on the screen all of the uh, principals uh, as we celebrate National Principal Month, we're going to uh, keep these two uh, individuals on the screen so that they can share a little bit about their first week. Exciting both, and we'll start with uh, Meadows, Ms. Johnson, and then we'll go straight on to Mr. Hare. Absolutely. Um, if there are acronyms for the word JOY, that is what I think um, my entire staff would say. We were overflowing with joy this week to have children back in the building and to be together, to be able to support them and encourage them. And the excitement and enthusiasm was just um, 
unprecedented after what we've been through. So it was a um, stressful time. I won't kid you, there are a lot of new precautions in place, but we have simply an amazing group of people that came together to make sure that we were able to get kids in the building and do it in a safe way and then celebrate. And we absolutely did. We've been celebrating all week long that we are back in the school building and getting to serve children. So it's been um, wonderful. And there have been some amazing things that have happened with some of the requirements that we didn't know we were gonna love. We absolutely love. Um, and Dr. Anderson, I don't know if I've gotten to thank you yet, but the micro classrooms, are wonderful and we are seeing just amazing things happen because of those micro classrooms. Um, we're watching children bond in ways we've never seen before. Uh, we have peaceful, peaceful playgrounds and peaceful lunchrooms and it's a very different feel and some of it feels even better than before. So we're excited and we just want to keep the kids in school Cool, keep things safe and we feel like we've got all the tools and equipment to make that happen so it's been a wonderful start and uh, we're excited that we're still in yellow so next week we keep them there thank you miss johnson and thank you for all that you do mr hare you bet um you know this is our first week with sixth grade which we've been looking forward to you know um teachers and principals rewards in their job as kids and we haven't seen kids in like seven months so um, for us, this has been a huge week. Um, sixth graders have been amazing coming in. We've been able to split them into the A's and B's groups. Um, and we've been able to practice all of our protocols and processes for our COVID reentry plans, which has been amazing for us as adults as well to be able to make sure all of our planning is working out the way it is. But I think more importantly, um, and I've talked with some of my colleagues, just the sixth graders maturity coming in this week and their um, seriousness about the understanding of of the COVID and procedures and wearing masks and all these new things, I, I just think have been just really remarkable. They've just really, um, like Ms. Johnson said, just a whole different feel for um, kids right now. And just, just that maturity alone and being able for our staff to be able to make relationships with kids in small groups, especially those transitioning kids from elementary to middle school and get faces with names and get to know kids this week has just been pretty amazing. Um, and so the small groups have been great and teachers have been doing a fantastic job in, the, in their, their rooms and even the remote and, and the kids in the classroom at the same time. I know I had a, a board member stop by this week as well and notice um, some great things happening. Um, but you know, you can hear from me, but I do have a couple of teachers on here, Miss Dr. Anderson. Um, I got Mr. Chavo and Miss Abellion who are sixth grade teachers in my building who could probably also share some excitement from what they've been seeing this week too, if you have a few minutes. That would be excellent. We started off with some children from Meadows and now we move right on up to our teachers. So uh, go right on ahead. I'm Miss Abellion. I teach science, sixth grade and seventh graders. And first thing I want to say thank you to the Board of Education. I just received my green card. So thank you for the patience and thank you for the job. We're gonna start from there. And I'm so grateful for just the, the school opening and the, the design of the COVID, um, the intervention. We did not let this COVID defeat us. So Mr. Hare and Mr. Haig, they did a pretty good job in starting our school. And just the protocol and all the, the expectation, it was pretty laid in front of us like teachers are you going to be ready here are the things and they listened to the staff and it was both for the students and even for the staff i appreciate that so i mean my kids my personal kids are asthmatic they're staying remote and I'm, i appreciate that the school district offered that full remote for the kids who's having that and opening for um opening the school for the teachers to teach and i appreciate that that I can still work, become a teacher, and still have safe safety for my own kids who's um, having this crazy COVID and having an asthma together. So it's just, again, thank you. It was a great week to start. 
I think we have another question yes. on, and then we'll turn it over to the board members if you'd like to ask questions of the principals during this highlight or of the teachers of this week or the upcoming uh, new model in some cases for next week. We'll turn it back over to our, our second teacher. Hello, my name is Robert Chavo, and I teach uh, ancient world history to sixth grade and United States history to eighth grade at Jardine Middle School. And, um, you know, one of the things that I just love this week is that I was able to build relationships. I mean, nothing beats being there with them for personally building the relationship. And um, that really, you know, it, it just feels a lot different. And um, I'm already just in one day felt better with the relationship with some of the kids than in the last couple of weeks of trying to do it online. Um, some of the, one of the other great things I really felt like I could see some of the students who were really struggling online. It was struggle to either stay engaged or to get work done or to do some things. And the moment they're in my classroom, I'm able to much able to figure out what it is that they need that they need help with. Um, there's technical issues that you can sometimes fix right there that will help them later on when they are remote. And so just having that opportunity to actually be with them even a sh one, you know even once in a while is going to help everything even at the times we can't be there um so basically i'm i'm just seeing lots of benefits this week with the students that i've been able to see and what i really like about the new plan that they're going to be changing is that we're going to be able to see them much more often and yet we're not sacrificing that social distancing um, abilities that we have by um you know, having half the kids in the school at one time. And I've also been really impressed by how well the kids have taken seriously the masks and the, the, the face guards and, and things like that. And just doing the things that we've asked them to do so far. It's just, it's been really, I think it's going really well. And I'm pretty much pretty positive about how the plan is gonna work as we change it to um, next week. And then the last thing I want to just say is just even in the spring, having to teach remotely and having to, to do the things we did, I've built up my toolbox to where even when we can go back to normal school, normal way, it's going to look different than it ever did before this and it's going to be better. And, and so I'm pretty happy about that stuff. So overall, I'm pretty excited about how things are going and really grateful that we're able to have school and, and get kids in here. And I asked every class, are you liking it better to be at school? Are you happy to be at school or at home? And every one of them were happier to be at school. So thank you very much. Are there any questions for uh, Mr. Hare, Mrs. Johnson, or the two instructors, two teachers that we've got? Dr. Morrison. Um, Mr. Hare or, and or Ms. Johnson, um, I'm, so far I've seen a pretty rosy and everybody's excited and everything. So tell me some negatives. I mean, uh, and the teachers can chime in too. I mean, it, it can't be all rosy. Uh, I've, I've been sitting and watching uh, kids remotely um, uh, matriculate and um, there's positives there's negatives there's difficulties so I mean just comment just uh, if and especially so we we can figure out if we can help you any right um, I think at the middle school level I mean just some of the I mean if you I would I would probably say challenges rather than negatives but uh, challenges have been you know just a little bit with internet um, a little bit with some connectivity and just a little bit of, you know, kids have been out of school really for seven months and trying to get kids back in their routines and habits. Um, that's, I mean, that's been the big, biggest challenge of middle school about expectations. And when you're, when you're away from it for so long, um, for adults or kids, it's just hard to get back in those routines. And so some of those challenges that we have just um, results are a result of the distance that we've been gone for such a long time. Sure, and I could share, you know, we're working with little kids, five-year-olds, and we're telling them they have to keep a mask on for, you know, the vast majority of their day, and that's tough, and it it's taxing on teachers to be monitoring that additional thing all the time. We're just teaching them to sit in a chair correctly, you know, most years, so that that's an additional struggle, but Again, um, teachers find a way. Uh, you never have to ask twice. The teachers will figure things out and they're doing it. They themselves are, you know, having long, hard days in those masks. Um, they're hot and they wear on them. And, you know, but they, they're willing to do it. 
because if that's what it takes to have a safe environment for themselves and the kids, they are absolutely willing to do it. So some of the procedures are challenges. There's no doubt about that. Um, but like I said, we are absolutely willing to do it. I just want to uh, want to just comment that I now I know how hard it is for the teachers and the administrators. Thank you guys very much. I mean, you're really sacrificing and you're, you know, it seems to me you're doing all the right things. So thank you. Any other questions or comments? Mrs. Bully and then Ms. Stuart Campbell. I just want to thank, I've been in a few of the buildings this week and we have such excellent ambassadors as our administrators. They are being strong leaders. They are accomplishing things that we've never asked them to do before. They are climbing to the top of the mountain on these challenges. And when I was walking through the buildings, teachers are working so hard and students are working so hard. And honestly, you all are doing an excellent job with the masks because most of the children have their masks on, even over their noses. <laughs> and I was just so gratified to see children back in school again and classrooms and teachers embracing them, uh, not physically, but emotionally and mentally and students were just so on task and happy to be there. And I don't know how, even over the years, how we will ever thank all of our leadership team here at the district level and at the building level and our teachers and our paras. You all are amazing to me and I appreciate every single one of you. And just thank you. All right, so first a, a comment. I have a sixth grader and she went to Landon this week and it was pretty amazing to me to hear her come home and talk about the new friends that she made. I'm like, so even though they're social distancing and following all the precautions, she made new friends and couldn't wait to go back the next day on Tuesday and is really excited to go next week. So. So I got to experience that joy. And for uh, Miss Avignon, congratulations on your green card or L L R P anyway, the other term. Um, so, cause you know, Topeka Public Schools really celebrates diversity of, of all kinds. So I'm, we're grateful to have you. And from what country did, did we, I get you from? I am from the Philippines and I joined Topeka Public Schools since 2007. Oh, okay. So we've had you for a while. And you're teaching remote only? Is that what I heard you say? No, my kids are doing remote only, oh. but I'm reporting to work. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. And I do have a question. And this is for Ms. Johnson. So how is it working out with the elementary kids who are staying remote? So are well, there there's separate teachers, right? Who are Yes, so there was a little bit of an adjustment phase um, because they had to separate from the teacher they had been working with and work with another teacher. So there was a little adjustment at the start of the week. Um, we did have to clarify with parents that, you know, as many times as you communicate things, it's just not always clear exactly what's going to happen. So we worked through that with parents and helped them understand the switches and why all that had to take place. Um, helped them make sure they had the right Zoom links, you know, that those are the challenges that come with making a switch like that. Um, but they did it and they're doing fine. We do have to work on making sure connectivity is up at homes. Um, that's a challenge in my community anyway. Um, and I imagine for most of our elementary schools, but we are working through all those pieces together. And so we're getting it done. It's, it is a challenge in that having to juggle both as an administrator, um, 
I've been an administrator for 17 years. I've never seen anything like this. It's really amazing. And the ingenuity of teachers just blows me away over and over again. Yes, I agree. Thank you. I have one final question for Mr. Hare. Mr. Hare, you mentioned the internet connectivity was an issue and we did a survey of almost 900 people respondents and responding and, and I think 6% still responded that they struggle with internet access. And so um, how are we resolving that? I know we've, we've taken some effort or made quite great efforts to try to improve that, but I still, you know, we've got to fix that. If those kids, especially at the middle and high school levels don't have internet access, how will we fix that? Uh, you know, there's a variety of things I think we've done so far. One is the district's had some hot spots that we've been able to get out to help out with connectivity. A lot, some, you know, some of the connectivity is just with a multiple amount of kids in a household and getting them all on. And so some of those hot spots have helped out with that. Um, now that we're back in the A and B phase, um, we've, we've managed to flip-flop some kids and families. So, so one or two kids are in school while the other kids are at home. So it helps out with the connectivity of the whole family and uh, not having them all labeled the same letter. Um, we've done some of that for our kids and, uh, and just try to help you know, parents problem solve some different things. And, uh, and you know, we're calling kids daily. Um, um, anyone who shows up not in a class, um, each of our schools has a, a team that calls out and A, talks to parents about you know, what are the issues going on? Is there connectivity? How can we help you? Um, and then we offer some supports and, uh, you know, Kids can still get on it in the evening, in the weekends, and get work caught up, and uh, and we just help them process um, the next steps for when that happens. And so we're still providing learning um, in and out of the normal school day, which is a, a benefit for um, you know this the COVID experience that we're having. But it's uh, there's some benefit, some pluses that parents can do too, um, and be able to provide that. So we're just you know each school is being creative, thinking outside the box a little bit. And uh, we're calling parents and parents are calling us and we're just working together and taking it individual by individual. Thank you for, for that response and your efforts to uh, make sure students have access to equitable learning. Ms. Bully, one more. I'm hoping that our community understands that when we have teachers in the classroom in the middle school and high school teaching half of their class, they're really not teaching half of their class. They have the other half on remote. So they have a full classroom, even though they're not all in the classroom. And if you've been trying to work from at home and you have little ones in your house and you're trying to manage them and manage your work screen, um, you can get an idea of multiplying that by probably a hundred. Our teachers are working so hard to try to manage all of these areas and I just wanted people to understand that they are teaching their whole class all the time all day long even though some of them are remote so those challenges of remote are now you know having to be managed at the same time you have students in your classroom so encourage your teachers um, send them an email when things are going right and and uh, congratulate them and praise them because our teachers are working harder than they have ever worked before. Our administrators are working harder than they ever have before. And we have to appreciate them for what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words and, and true words. With those, with those uh, final highlights, uh, we do want to mention uh, later this evening when we're finished with fine arts, high school is not on here, but TCALC certainly has had almost a double enrollment and Dr. Morrell and and Ms. Johnson will join at the very end uh, should there, if there's time to have them share how their first week has been as well. We just want to thank all of our administrators. Uh, we so appreciate them, their dedication. They are simply amazing. Even our brand new administrators last night on the news, Mr. Buckendorf and the Highland Park team was receiving a donation. So he's already making connections with research. I believe it was $1,000 uh, that was given last night to them for the Spanish club. Thank you, Mr. Buckendorf at a Highland Park High. And then, uh, 
again, uh, Mr. Uh, Hare and his uh, awesome team, along with Ms. Johnson, I don't think you can get more enthusiasm than the two of them. You guys have to read that proclamation every week. Uh, not every week, every year. Love to have you come back again. I do want to also mention that all of the other administrators are watching on Facebook. And so parents, send a kudos to your principals. If you uh, uh, attend, and even if you don't have children that attend Topeka Public Schools, this entire month, you have the opportunity to acknowledge your principals. From the district level, every week, the uh, district is doing something to recognize our principals, podcasts, uh, TV videos, former students who are now in some pretty amazing careers. They'll be commenting. So tune in to our social media. And again, happy National Principals Month. Uh, it, uh, you all inspire us all, and it is an honor to work alongside you. Thank you. As we have concluded our highlights, uh, and we're uh, going to turn it back over to uh, the board, we do want to mention that uh, both of our pledge students, we didn't see their certificate on the screen, but they both from Meadows do have a certificate. So our young people who are our twins who are not on the screen right now will be delivering that to your school on Friday. I'll turn it back on over to um, uh, the president. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Next on the agenda is public public communications, and I understand there are none. Is that right, Ms. Lister? Thank you. Um, next is business uh, disposition of business by consent. Entertain a motion to take care of that. Mr. President, I move the board approve the items of business by consent as presented and authorize the board president or superintendent to sign the special project and purchasing contracts for and on behalf of the board. Thank you, Reverend Williams. We have a motion. We have a second. Mrs. Bully offers a second. Is there any discussion? I'd just like to acknowledge uh, three local churches have made donations to Williams Magnet School, Watermaker Woods Church in the Nazarene, First Presbyterian Church, and Grace, Grace Episcopal Church have all made a financial contribution uh, between the three of those congregations of $2,000. So thank you to those almost $2,000 looks like. Actually, it's more than that, $2,150. If I did my math right, I'd know that. So we thank, thank the uh, congregations in those churches for their support of Williams Magnet School. Okay, we're ready to vote, Ms. Lister. Thank you. Next is our superintendent's report, Dr. Anderson. Uh, this evening we'll be starting with fine arts. Now remember every week we've been talking about some section of school and what elementary is going to look like, uh, what uh, athletics looks like. Uh, this evening we're talking about fine arts and what fine arts looks like. So we're going to turn it over to our fine arts team. But before we do, we love to share all the accolades about our staff. And so some of our fine arts team members were on the news and were highlighted for all the precautions and the creativity. So we're going to start with a two minute video on that and then turn it over to the fine arts team. Teachers say the fine arts are an important outlet for school-aged children, especially during the uncertainty of a pandemic. That's why the Topeka Public Schools District is finding a way to make them happen safely. KSNT News reporter Kelly Peltier has more. When school starts back up for the district virtually, music and art classes will begin with pre-recorded lessons and focus on things they don't usually have time for. Responding more to music, doing more creating and like connecting through music in different ways. When things moved to the hybrid model with students back in the classroom. We will have to wear masks with slits in them for mouthpieces to go through for all the wind players. Um, we'll have bell covers on the instruments. Um, we'll be at six foot social distancing in straight rows instead of the traditional curved uh, kind of arches or arcs that we normally have. And through the inevitable challenges. Our band class meets at 7.55 in the morning. So for students who may live in an apartment complex, um, their neighbors may not want to hear them drumming or playing their trumpets. They're remembering the benefits that come with their students having access to these classes. Maybe you're a struggling reader, all of these things, but you can come into an art room or a music room or a theater room and you can just excel. As for the theater, they're planning to work on virtual shows, outdoor performances, and costume design at home. Reporting in Topeka, Kelly Peltier, KSNT News. 
and they are putting together an at-home arts kit, as well as sending things like clay home for their students while they're at home. Virtual classes for the district start on September 9th. So with that uh, introduction, Mr. Reynolds oversees our fine arts department and those same teachers you just saw on the video, each will be speaking to one uh, uh, page of the PowerPoint. I will turn it over to Mr. Reynolds and team. Hey, thank you, Dr. Anderson, and thank you members of the board for allowing us to present tonight. Uh, we're going to kind of give you an overview of the recommendations that we've uh, spent the summer researching through organizations such as the uh, Educational Theater Association, National Association of uh, Art Educators, National Association of Music Educators, and we're, we're presenting the mitigations and the uh, procedures that we'll have in line to reduce some of the risks in the fine arts classrooms. So uh, I would like to take the opportunity to thank everybody for the support that we're getting in the fine arts. Um, it, it's amazing. Thank you for uh, making sure that the fine arts stays relevant in our students' lives. So tonight I have members of the, uh, the fine arts uh, curriculum assessment team, and they're gonna kind of talk to you about some of the things that we've put into place to make sure that our students can continue to be successful in the classroom for fine arts. So I'm gonna turn things over to uh, Barbie Atkins, uh, who's gonna talk to you about uh, art. Hi, I'm Barbie. I teach art at Robinson Middle School. Thank you for letting me be here tonight. <laughs> all right, so um, we worked really, really hard all summer. Um, right now, everyone's still working really hard. Uh, but we did a lot of research and a lot of planning to do the best that we could possibly do for, um, for our babies, for our colleagues, for, for everybody involved. At the elementary level in the visual arts, um, we based off of our research and what other districts were doing around the nation and trying to align to CDC guidelines as closely as we possibly could. Um, our plan um, turned out to be to have our amazing elementary art educators. They turned into art on a cart teachers. Um, so they all had traveling carts that they're working with now and they're going into individual classrooms. Um, so at the elementary level, we do, uh, we do have art bins for them to keep classroom supplies and classroom, um, portfolio separate, um, to try to reduce as much cross contamination or anything as possible. At the secondary level, we were super excited that um, the district was generous enough to purchase uh, art supply kits to go out to our art students at the secondary level. Those supply kits were absolutely crucial in helping alleviate budget concerns at individual buildings. Um, and just making art possible in this impossible time that we're in right now. So thank you. I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to uh, Amanda Porter, who's going to talk about the theater uh, uh, procedures that we're going to start implementing. Hi, so um, yeah, I'm Amanda Porter. I teach at Topeka High School Stagecraft, the technical side of theater. So um, as we are working this summer, we had to look at a number of different pieces of science and research. Um, we looked at the Educational Theater Association. We looked at surrounding districts. Um, and we also looked at professional organizations as well as the science that has been centered around uh, how music works as the aerosol studies have found um, with projection are a match there. So we've taken all of that and we created some procedures in-house and decided how we're going to proceed both in our classrooms as well as in our extracurricular activities. So one of the first things we looked at was um, how do we work with our supplies? Um, and if we're looking specifically at the technical side of theater, uh, we know that we can't all have a student um, have their own miter saw, or their own drill. It's just not possible. So we were able to um, be successful in creating a list that the district provided us uh, and paid for for tools and hand hand objects like measuring tools and speed squares that we could use in our classrooms and rotate. 
Um, so what this allows us to do is even though we can't provide all of the tools for each kid to have their own materials, um, we are allowing to have enough classroom supplies so that students don't have to share their items and allow for us to sanitize between classes. So um, we will still do some, some building that's gonna look a little bit differently, obviously, once we reach that hybrid because of social distancing and because our programs um, are different across each high school, but also um, our seasons change from year to year. So we've been focusing on making sure that the, the schools um, not only know how to build and to work with their technicians, um, but also that the shows that we're selecting are safe for not only actors, but also technicians. So then we also have student supply kits for um, our stagecraft and, and technical students. So every kit um, includes different art supplies um, and things that are geared towards the technician so they can do design work and small hands-on projects at home. And we really wanted to focus on that hands-on learning because knowing that they're gonna have so much screen time throughout the year, we knew that having that kinesthetic learning opportunity was going to be important. Um, one of the things that we included this year was a print model, which was uh, given to every acting and technical theater teacher in the district. Um, and what that did was provide a scale of different set pieces that students can then fold on paper and manipulate. So they still got some of that um, context for how to use a set, even though we're not building full sets this year. Uh, we also were um, wonderful, uh, wonderfully surprised by the supplemental script budget. Um, so thank you for providing us the opportunity to um, get individual scripts for students. Uh, a lot of the times we were able to um, use public domain, but we knew that this year uh, with scripts not being able to sanitize between student use, uh, paper being a big issue with that, we were able to acquire $300 per building. So that way uh, each director or each teacher could decide what scripts were really needed in order to make sure that we are keeping with the copyright laws. Um, so that's one thing uh, that we've done with scripts. Um, the last thing is cleaning supplies. So we are working with still continuing on with having shows and um, whether that's virtual or if it's outside uh, or we're, we're hosting different overflow classes in the auditorium um, and other areas. We are uh, using different supplies given by the district that are specific for our content area. So um, in general, we've just been able to uh, take some of the policies in the science and apply it to our classrooms in order to provide as much hands-on experience for students as possible. Awesome, thank you, Amanda, very much. Um, I'm gonna turn things over to uh, Ashley Greenlee. Um, she's gonna talk about the music side, which will entail elementary music, vocal music, band, and orchestra. We might have a technical difficulty going on. Um, Sorry, I thought I unmuted. <laughs> Teacher problems. <laughs> I apologize. My name is Ashley Greenlee, and I am uh, the choir director at Topeka High School, and I also teach enjoyment of music. Uh, I wanted to start by saying that I truly believe all of our music educators across 501 are doing their best to keep students safe and to keep making quality music in new and innovative ways while also maintaining the tradition of excellence that I know our community expects. Each discipline has provided uh, has specific procedures in place to clean, sanitize, and disinfect in between student use of instruments, materials, and seating areas while we're in the building. We're also practicing six foot social distancing and straight rows in all the secondary classrooms as we're able. At the elementary level, we got these great traveling carts from Harbor Freight. It's literally like a garage tool kit. And in that, you have a tray for a laptop, USB and power connections, locations for cleaning supplies, and drawers for instruments. The carts are metal and they're white, so they can actually be used as dry erase boards and magnetic, and it's magnetic, so that's really great for those teachers. I know that a lot of our elementary fine arts teachers are traveling all over the building, so kudos to all of them for being so flexible. 
Uh, our music teacher sent home student supply kits, and those include a scarf, eight beat rhythmic notation manipulatives, eight beat melodic notation manipulatives, and rhythm sticks, egg shakers, pool noodles, things like that, to, so they can create music at home. With technology, our elementary teachers are using xylophone apps on their Chromebooks. They have iPads, as you all know, uh, for helping students. And with those, they are doing rhythmic, melodic, and a lot of movement things for the standards at the elementary level. And um, at this time also, as students are back in the building, we're not doing any singing indoors. So we wanted to make you aware of all of that happening at the elementary level. In secondary vocal music, each student is being provided a three-ply surgical style mask every day that they have a choral rehearsal. So starting Monday, they'll get them four days or two, four days a week right? No, my saying, no, yeah, I'm not going to say that, two days a week. So anyway, uh, during these rehearsals, students are singing in alternate locations. Um, we have to move every 30 minutes to sing in different spaces so that we can keep our air safe for our students and teachers. And we're really working to grow in all four of our curricular areas, including creating, performing, responding, and connecting for our curriculum. Our students have received practice tracks and vocal model tracks for at-home rehearsals. And we're also utilizing Flipgrid a lot for student video submission. Since we're not able to hear our students singing in class, this is really allowing us to modify our daily lessons and focus on student needs and successes. One really awesome thing that the district did for us is uh, to temporarily replace live concerts. We've acquired over 700 student and teacher memberships to Soundtrap recording software. This was a humongous investment for us and we just so appreciate it. This software allows students to upload audio recordings to create a virtual ensemble. So within Soundtrap, we're able to mix, edit, loop, auto-tune, create beats, and do so much more. And we're able to just get students involved in such a great way with that uh, audio engineering process, but also provide things at home for family members and community members to see. With our band and orchestra programs, the orchestra is really fortunate that they don't have to do all of the things with aerosols and moisture. So I'm really happy for them that they get to wear their masks and social distance. And for the most part, while they're in the building, do as much as they can that is our normal. But for our band students, we've actually purchased specific musician masks that they'll wear when playing their wind and brass instruments. These masks have an opening in them, as you heard Mr. Bradshaw say on the video, that allows students to stay masked while they're playing their instrument. We also purchased bell covers, and almost all of them are here now, which is awesome. And uh, we're, those will help to minimize the amount of moisture that goes into the air while a student plays their instrument. And then we have puppy pads. And if you've ever had a dog, you know what a puppy pad is. But for band, the puppy pads have been purchased for band classes to allow a location that collects instrument condensation. So this just really helps to keep things so clean. Um, so far, our sev several of our buildings have been able to have a lot of great success in our instrumental programs. I know some of our teachers have been able to hold drumline rehearsals outside and have had really successful compliant practices. Um, teachers are being able to use technology to help students have more individual practice at home. We've been able to do a lot more collaborating with district-wide colleagues and for the music department, and I think this is for the district total, we just have two music uh, student teachers. We've got two awesome student teachers in our department that we know are just gonna be prepared for anything and everything when they're finished. So uh, thanks for letting me speak about music in 501. We've got a great group and really amazing kids. Thank you, Ashley. And uh, we're going to uh, turn things over to, to Mr. Bradshaw. And during a previous board meeting, Dr. Morrison brought up when we were talking about athletic combines that it would be neat to see um, a fine arts combine. 
Uh, so we've done some brainstorming and Mr. Bradshaw is gonna talk a little bit about what that might look for our fine arts students. Uh, yes, thanks, Chris. Hi, everyone. I'm Eric Bradshaw, and I am the director of bands and music department chair at Topeka High. Um, and every t I'm sorry, I have to say up front that uh, when I heard myself on the TV interview, I'm always reminded of my um, accent. I blame that on growing up in West Virginia and spending 25 years between Alabama and Georgia. So I will try to speak clearly. I'm sorry. Um, I get to talk about some of the more fun things. So right now, uh, Keisha events are still a little bit up in the air. Um, we're trying to figure out how we're going to have these uh, either virtual or in person. And that would include things like our solo and ensemble festivals and our large group festivals, uh, which are both critical to the educational process in music. Um, and then in uh, one of the other things I'm really excited about, I get to talk more about the fun stuff. Sorry, they got all the PPEs and all that stuff. So, um, we talked about doing a college fine arts fair, and this is actually something that I brought up uh, probably a little over a year ago. Chris may remember when. Um, it's a similar to what uh, I was part of starting when I was teaching in Georgia, and it was hugely successful and a great way to get our students an opportunity to really meet with um, representatives from area colleges and universities. And so what it would be is we'd have like a central location. And ideally this would take place in around uh, early November. This year things could be a little bit different because of COVID. Uh, but it would take place here in Topeka area somewhere. Um, universities would be invited. And typically uh, in the past when I did this, they would usually send someone from their admissions office as well as somebody directly from their fine arts department, music department, theater department, et cetera. And students would have a chance to meet with them, learn about their program, sometimes even set up an actual audition date, um, give them their portfolio and just really share information so they could try to make an educated decision and also just get their name out there. Um, and it, like I said, we had great luck with that and I think it would go very well here for our students. And then also in the spring as a way to really showcase our students um, if we were able to create a fine arts showcase event where art could be displayed, um, short theater uh, productions, whether it be monologues or something of that effect, and then of course singing and playing uh, short pieces by some of our outstanding senior scholarship recipients, maybe if we have all state members or all national recognition students, things like that. And again, university personnel could be invited back to that and possibly even um, not just be there, but maybe finish the evening with presentation, official presentations of scholarships or something like that. So we're really trying to find some ways to bring awareness to the amazing uh, students that we have and also very talented students we have. So, and then lastly, we have the Texas Thespian Festival, which I'm actually gonna let Ms. Porter speak about because I'm not as familiar with that. Uh, yeah, so the International Thespian uh, Society is an honor society that um, honors student achievement in theater, both on the technical and performance side. Um, and Kansas is actually the third largest in the nation um, as far as the ITS goes. Uh, we had two of the five International Thespian officers in the last three years from Kansas. They even had to make a rule specifically because we had too many kids making it onto this um, board so uh, they in implemented that and then at the international festival that goes um, often abroad uh, three of the five shows that were featured were from kansas so losing the kansas thespian conference was such a huge deal um, we 501 specifically was able to acquire a couple of scholarships both through performance and technical theater uh, the last several years so um, being able to be invited to the Techna, the Texas Thespian Festival was, was a really big deal. They're offering it for four Saturdays for the cost of $50 per student. Um, the deadline is October 16th and it's going to allow for um, students to present different in individual events, uh, perform for colleges, compete for scholarships, and just allow both professional um, and community theater people to come in and work with our students, as well as professional development for all theater teachers across the district. So um, if you have a student who's interested, uh, who would like to attend these Saturday events, 
$50 is going to go a long way. And so we're really excited to be a part of that. And we're looking forward to, to participating in the coming few months. Thank you. So lastly, I just wanted to take the opportunity to talk and, and let people know that we're going to do everything we can to allow our students to be, be able to still continue to perform, to create, still do everything that we do in the fine arts. And I know we've heard it over and over that things are going to look different, but we have some very creative staff that are looking into ways to make our students still be able to do what they do. So communication is one of the things that we are working on right now, uh, talking to the families and talking to the community that uh, sometimes we may not be able to have a certain event happen at a certain time. We may have to be a little bit flexible. Um, all of our schools are looking at open source, royalty free, copyright free type of materials. I know Dr. Sawyer talked a few weeks ago about State Street and Chase doing a production that is going to be able to be broadcast through video. So we're looking at lots of different ways of either streaming or doing pre-recorded stuff. Um, Amanda and I have talked, they're looking at one of their theatrical performances of actually being outdoors uh, to provide a, a social distancing atmosphere for our students and parents as well. Uh, we're very happy to uh, be getting ready for uh, home football games with the bands. I did talk to some people that said that they sure missed uh, having that band sound. So our plan is the next, uh, uh, each one of the high schools will be able to perform and it's going to be more like a pep band style. Um, we're going to keep the numbers smaller, the, we're going to socially distance across the stands and still be able to provide some entertainment. We're also looking at some ways to do some virtual art shows and displays within the community because I know that um, we tend to do final Fridays and first Fridays, but the, that's not happening as much. So we're really gonna have to find some non-traditional ways to showcase what our students are doing. Um, I, I'll give you an example of non-traditional. Uh, Ms. Greenlee uh, actually has worked out with Grace Cathedral to where her students are gonna do part of her time at Topeka High rehearsal, and then they're gonna be able to walk down and do part of their rehearsal at uh, Grace Cathedral, because uh, what the research shows is that we're only allowed to rehearse 30 minutes at a time. Um, so I, I would really be remiss if I didn't thank all the members of the fine arts curriculum assessment team. Uh, they've really worked their uh, worked through their summer to make sure that we started our school year with the necessary items. So uh, Dr. Dr. Anderson and the board, I, I thank you for the time and, and I open up for any questions that you might have. Does anyone have any questions? Dr. Morrison, I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Reynolds, I'm blown away by your research and the work that you've done uh, for this, because that's this is not little stuff. This is big stuff. It's very important in our society to have the arts and to have our children see the arts and participate and perform in everything that it's very, very important. My, my only question is to Ms. Porter, and that's that $50 fee. I'm, I'm wondering about kids that can't afford that $50 fee. Well, um, you have to be a registered troop in order to participate in the festival at all. Um, so unfortunately, it's up to each building to determine how that works with their building principal. Um, and so oftentimes we hold scholarships for students. Um, we started a scholarship last year for students uh, and where we take into account their um, needs as well as their con contribution to the theater department as a whole. Uh, so we have, are often having to turn kids away. Um, from that and $50 is um, for four Saturdays and usually the theater festival is for a three-day weekend, um, usually the first weekend in January and it's upwards of almost over $200 including lodging. So, um, and that's usually in Wichita at Century 2. So they've really scaled down in order to provide us with some pretty big names in the theater and film industries. Um, so it, I would suggest uh, talking to your directors and seeing um, what is it, what options are available as each building is operating with their troops differently. And Dr. Morrison, just so that you know, Mrs. Wallace, uh, for this year, we have many clubs that have needed some uh, various supports. I think just yesterday it was um, 
facts at Highland Park that we were addressing in terms of needs. So teaching and learning is prepared to assist as it relates to a scholarship related matters. Topeka High is one of the schools that uh, does receive title funds as well. So as we have significant scholarship needs, uh, Mr. Reynolds will be looking at that this year during the pandemic. It's just an unusual year and anything we can do to engage young people this year, we will be doing. Ms. Wallace, did you want to add to that at all? that there are multiple sources for funding, um, title uh, federal dollars, as well as teaching and learning dollars. And then each school also has an activity fund and other funds in which they scholarship students. So um, it would be our plan this year that we don't turn students away from this opportunity. That's, uh, that's fantastic. Um, I, I want to just say again, I'm blown away by what you've all done and thank you all for working so hard for our students. Thank you. Any other questions or Dr. Wilmerick? Uh, again, I second Dr. Morrison, an incredible amount of work. Uh, very tongue in cheek. Mrs. Greenley, have you discouraged French horns and encouraged everybody to play tubas and baritones? I'm sorry. <laughs> French horns are the best. I love French horns. <laughs> they blow to the side, though. <laughs> Usually, they French horn players make really great singers, too. So. Well, Mr. Reynolds, we want to make sure that we thank you this evening uh, for your very thorough and detailed presentation and uh, for the staff that came out this evening. Uh, you are exceptional. Topeka Public Schools is nationally known for music and arts, and so, and it is because of staff members like you. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Appreciate the time tonight. With that, you've heard a bit about the beginning of the school from elementary and middle, and at this time, uh, Dr. Morell would like to give a brief update about his first week. He's representing the high school. I should have also shared that Mrs. Uh, Sharp, see, normally all the principals would be here and you'd get a chance to meet them directly since they are now off of the screen, but they were listening in. Ms. Sharp oversees the early childhood and elementary. She's now uh, logging on off, and Dr. Hackett oversees the secondary, and of course, Ms. Wallace uh, works with all the principals as it relates to teaching and learning. At this time, is if Dr. Morell has joined us, then he'll just give a snapshot of uh, the TCALC, which those students do attend every day, and as does uh, college prep. College prep, interestingly, started coming before now just because they wanted to have in-person teaching, and so they've been uh, working with their teachers individually as uh, appropriate in that model with Ms. Foster. Uh, Dr. Morell, would you like to give an update about TCALC uh, for the next uh, couple of minutes? Absolutely. So we uh, tomorrow we'll end up our first week at TCALC with uh, almost double the number of students we ended up with in the spring. So we ended up with 103 students last spring, and we opened uh, this year with 178 students. So we're very excited about that, but wanted to let you know that it has been, except for a few bumps in transportation, which is normal the first week or so, uh, it has been a great week. Uh, the students have uh, really taken to the building, of course, and the, the students were excited to see the building, be in the building, and the teachers as well to work with the students. So they've done well with wearing the mask. We haven't had any problems there. And uh, we've also marked our hallways so that we have one-way traffic going east and west, and that's worked well too as far as moving throughout the building. Uh, Ms. Johnson, who wasn't able to join us this evening, we were talking earlier today about as we waited for students to get off the bus so that we could take their temperatures, that nowhere in our ed leadership studies did we uh, discover that we would be taking temperatures. But it has been really good for us to get to know the students earlier and faster. So actually, it's been a great week, and uh, we're looking forward to moving forward this year. Thank you, Dr. Morell. I don't know if there are questions for Dr. Morell about his very first week. Interestingly, some of the remote students who are remote are still coming to TCALC every day. So they're remote with the exception of TCALC. So that was interesting to learn when I was visiting TCALC. And the last item, the College Prep Academy, uh, they are, uh, since they have micro uh, spaces that they're working to create, they're trying something a little new 
with putting cameras in a few different classrooms so Ms. Foster can teach in one class uh, so the students don't have to, uh, a big part of college prep is being together, uh, the entire group, and that way the group can report to class, six feet social distanced, and then have breakout rooms like you have in Zoom, but within TCALC, uh, with a camera in the space uh, and a laptop, and then the teacher can actually monitor the room and talk with the students in the other classrooms. That's something new that we're trying out next week, and uh, we'll continue, as Mrs. Johnson said, to allow teachers and their ingenuity to just uh, go to work so we can continue to connect with kids as much as possible directly. I'll turn it over to the board if you have questions about any of those areas uh, or any other matters about the beginning of the year. Mr. Munoz. Yeah, I think TCALC is, is a amazing experiment to try and get kids to explore uh, career, potential careers in the future. My question is, uh, what do you think explains the increase in, in enrollment? What is it that uh, caused that? Any sense? Well, I think it's just a matter of time and, and being able to communicate more to the community and the more that we, you know, let people know what we're doing. And of course, it helps too that the students that were at TCAL, word of mouth really helps. So we had a lot of students that came last year and visited while uh, school was in session. And so now they're TCALC students this year, but it's just a matter of communication and being uh, consistent and persistent with that. Dr. Morrell, can, can you speak to the new animal science curriculum you have at TCALC? Um... Oh, absolutely. We have uh, uh, animal science uh, program that started again this year, and uh, we have a fantastic teacher that is uh, certified ag teacher and is also a, uh, a state, was a state specialist in uh, uh, Future Farmers of America, the career and technical student organization for animal science. And so we have uh, every pathway has a career uh, advisory board, which helps us with curriculum and with uh, equipment and also with uh, guest speakers and hopefully internships. And people throughout the state have been really good about coming forward and saying, we'd like to be a part of your pathway and a part of your advisory committee. So a lot of good things are happening there and students are really excited. In fact, the teacher uh, went out of her way to do a lot of things before she actually got into the classroom. So we have connections statewide that have really been helpful and uh, will serve us well in the future. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Morrison. Huh. Yeah, Dr. Morrell, could you speak just briefly, what pathways have gone away and what added ones this year that you have? So the animal science is the one that is new this year. And then uh, we, had, we lost fire science this year due to uh, you know, lack of numbers. Ms. Drew Campbell. I am so excited about TCALG. So I think of my middle school children and when they get to high school, what, what pathway they'll do. Right. So that's my comment. Um, my question is, how is it decided which pathways will be offered? A lot of it is student interest. So normally before a pathway is offered, there's a student survey and it also, uh, the federal government has, uh, through Perkins funding, which we get a lot of our uh, funding through Perkins, has required that we do a what we call an assessment of the region. So it used to be in Perkins 4, which ended last year, that we'd have to do just a local regional or local assessment of needs or labor needs, et cetera. This year, starting with Perkins 5, it is a regional needs assessment, uh, which was conducted between February and May of last year. So that's what really goes into it is what is needed as far as the labor market and also what the students are interested in. Any other questions? I don't see any, Dr. Morrell. Thank you for your time tonight and your continued leadership at TCALC and at uh, College Prep. Thank you. That concludes the beginning of the school update, uh, school year update uh, on the elementary, middle, and high, as you heard from the principals. But we stand for questions on any matters related to the beginning of school. I'll turn it over to the board. What questions do you have for Dr. Anderson or uh, any other people still on the line? I'll start with one. So transportation um, for parents and patrons who might be listening with the new schedule for the middle and high school. So 
your recommendation is to work with principals. Maybe you could expand on that a little bit. Absolutely. Mr. Robbins, our deputy superintendent, is on. He oversees transportation. Uh, as uh, we pull him up on the screen uh, to address transportation uh, in general, uh, we are asking that if parents uh, have uh, a challenge that they need met, that they connect with their principal. And there are all kinds of things that are occurring, which include, uh, as you all know, previously you've helped purchase uh, bus passes, you've approved for us to purchase bus passes. But I also want to say Topeka Metro has been such an amazing partner. They're allowing for free bus rides all throughout October. So that allows for that to continue to occur. We also uh, are ensuring that uh, many of our students who uh, have have had transportation in some aspect uh, are addressed directly. And again, it's a case by case issue, uh, but we are addressing those uh, and some of those needs in creative ways, which may include a uh, having a bus. Uh, so uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Robbins in terms of what that looks like. Uh, just as one final note, the state requires if you live 2.5 miles from uh, the school, then that would be when you would offer something. Uh, and so uh, Mr. Robbins will speak to where we are in terms of how we're trying to support families with that uh, rule as well and any other matters. Mr. Robbins. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Uh, Dr. Mickelson and the rest of uh, the board members, uh, just to kind of give you a little background and history about where we are transportation wise, uh, we had to move our uh, distance, our uh, uh, parameter for uh, transportation this year back from one mile that we had been using for a number of years back to two miles. Uh, and that is because of the guidelines that are associated with the uh, trying to provide a safe and secure environment around the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we have buses that, uh, for the most part, average about 77 uh, as far as a number and capacity that with the guidelines that we have been given when it comes to social distancing of having one student per seat, uh, that capacity re reduces to 23. In looking at the number of students that qualify uh, for transportation in order to meet the max capacity that Kansas Central had uh, here in Topeka, we had to move that distance back to two miles. Uh, I know that that has created some problems uh, for uh, families uh, that were accustomed to the one mile distance, but uh, you know, this is something that uh, you know, really we didn't have much of a choice. Uh, and had to make that change this year. With what we're starting to do as far as uh, on-site attendance uh, next week, where we are having uh, both the A and B group uh, come each day uh, of the days that we are providing on-site uh, education. Uh, we reached out not only to uh, Kansas Central here locally, but uh, reached out to their regional operations team uh, to uh, have them evaluate and assess uh, whether or not they had the ability to provide midday transportation in addition to the transportation that they currently provide uh, both before and after school. Uh, it took them uh, a few days to look at that. They came back and, and told us that uh, what was going to be required in terms of routes and also in terms of drivers uh, said that they thought they could uh, in conversation with them we said you know uh, thinking that you could is not going to be enough for us to base decisions on we need to know uh, that you absolutely can support what we're asking for in that midday transportation. And what we were asking for was the ability to uh, take a students home uh, at midday when their class periods ended, while at the same time be transporting B students into their respective buildings to begin their half day of uh, instruction. Uh, they said when pressed that they didn't feel comfortable enough to say that they could ensure that we would have consistent, uninterrupted transportation uh, both ways. 
Uh, so we asked them, what did they feel that they could support? Uh, they have since kind of surveyed their drivers. Uh, they have come back and said that they could do one or the other. Uh, and that one or the other would be either transporting uh, a students home uh, after their class periods ended or bringing B students into school uh, to begin their afternoon session. Uh, where we have it left right now, we're looking at bringing the B students in uh, so that they can begin their afternoon session uh, and allowing the A students to use the uh, alternative transportation that we have with the Pika Metro uh, to get back to uh, their destination. Uh, they did feel that they would be able to consistently support uh, that sort of arrangement from a resource standpoint. Uh, but in order to schedule that and be ready from a route standpoint, uh, they said that they would not be able to uh, do a quick turnaround to have this ready to go uh, beginning next week, uh, October the 5th. They need a week to get not only routes uh, arranged, but also the bid and posting that they have to do uh, in alignment with their union contract with their drivers uh, to be ready to start uh, this new uh, transportation model. Uh, and they have committed that they would be ready the following Monday uh, and that would be the week of October the 12th. So the only transportation that would be available for next week would be transporting the A students to class in the morning uh, and then the evening transportation home, which would address the B students. Uh, and then it would be a week later before we would be able to start uh, the new plan that I just uh, shared uh, with the board. And with those uh, items that Mr. Robbins has shared, uh, the uh, uh, prior to uh, adjusting our model, and uh, we looked at our survey data as it related to transportation, uh, and just asked parents, without transportation, would you still like more student access? Uh, because at that time, and still at this time, we did not uh, want to plan on the midday access, so we asked the question. Uh, so, uh, and at that time, we had not established the partnership with uh, Metro, uh, had not sent us that partnership information yet either. We knew we had bus passes, but we know those are finite. So we asked the question, and from that, uh, with the survey data, which is actually on our website, uh, the majority of parents shared they would still like in-person access uh, despite the transportation. The hardship surveys that we've been giving out, uh, the first several that came in yesterday uh, demonstrated that uh, many of the families actually didn't have a hardship as long as they knew what group they were coming in. Uh, many families do, but uh, Dr. Gray uh, gave an update to that survey data, and I think only 70 individuals uh, returned something to which I believe 30 of those had a hardship or 50 of those. Is that correct, Dr. Gray? 55 of those had a hardship. Uh, now, whether they listed that they had that hardship or not, uh, still Dr. Kipp ran a report of all students who are in specialty groups, which may include uh, a forced transfer, special ed IEP, students who um, uh, live uh, for the dual language program in other areas that are an extended distance, or students who uh, have some other specialty group that causes them to have an additional hardship. So principals are connecting with those families because routes are being run based on those students who already have routes who fall in those categories. Um, now, some families uh, have contacted schools who may or may not have had a route, but just the midday adjustment, they need uh, some added support. So the following supports are in place for those families. Again, I encourage them to contact their principal. In some cases, principals have after school programs. And so they're starting those at a time and have tutoring to allow the student to stay throughout the day and to leave at the end of the day. In some cases, uh, just a bus pass is being provided, especially if they didn't already have a bus. Uh, all of the newcomer English uh, uh, language students uh, are staying all day. They're staying the full day. Uh, if they have limited English, 
English. Uh, and so uh, those are some of those areas that have been addressed, but each principal is connecting directly with their families, seeing what the need is and working with them to see what supports they can provide should there be a support. This uh, really only packs the middle school. Um, it doesn't unpack the elementary and we were not providing buses anyway to the high school. Uh, those are just some added items to know. I'll turn it back over to you, uh, President. So if we were to prioritize, so there's really four, if in a perfect world, we had an unlimited budget, we would provide four bus routes, the, the A students arrival to school, departure, B students arrival to school and their departure in the afternoon. If we were to prioritize those from a parent's perspective, do we know which one they would need more than another? You know, I'm, I'm um, and I, and meeting with the middle schools, uh, and my apologies, sir, will you? Go ahead. And meeting with the middle schools, Ms. Hoffman, uh, you know, who is the lead uh, for the middle schools, uh, she uh, shared that the B group, you know, getting to school, once you get to school, the principals are working with you on how to get home, whether it's staying for an after school program, whether it's uh, other, a variety of other things, Boys and Girls Club, they're picking up students. Uh, and do know that our high school students already take the city bus. That's their transportation already. So, uh, but the issue is getting the B students to school was the, uh, could be the challenge of, you know, parents in the middle of the day getting B students to school. So getting the other students to school, the B route is really the focus of uh, if the buses are going to do a midday route and they know they can do one route, that would be the B. So parents who might say, hey, they really had a hardship, uh, they might have been changed to the B group. Uh, and so that they can be in the B route so they can come during that time. The other item that's been offered by the principals is that if a parent would like to stay remote for a week um, or come two days, all of those then still are platforms that exist and parents that want to stay remote for that week so they can just wait for that full transportation because they weren't expecting any transportation with this adjustment, uh, they're being offered that as well and that's being accommodated. Is it one final question is the Topeka Metro adjusted their bus routes at all to accommodate schools and students? Do you know, or are they sticking with their established bus routes? And unless something's changed, Mr. Robbins, no, they have their established bus routes, but they have given us maps, uh, which last year they gave us, which really line up nicely with the school schedules. And there are bus routes in front of, uh, if not all, the majority of our schools are very close to all, uh, very close to the school or actually in front of the school. And so um, actually today we're picking up the pamphlets, that's the trifold that shows you the route, the time. So that'll also be provided for students who need that, if there are even students who need that. Here's an example, so at Robinson, they only have 17 students that ride the bus, uh, period. Uh, another school shared, they have, I think today, Eisenhower talked about their sixth graders. They have three students riding the bus this year. I mean, so what sounds like uh, Chase has 80, I believe, eight students this year that rode the bus. So again, uh, the hardship may not be as significant as some may think, uh, but again, for those that need a bus, city bus, and or that just want a city bus, uh, uh, for other reasons, the principals are working with them. It's probably a paradigm shift for most of us that grew up in the Midwest and haven't ridden the city bus much. You know, truthfully, if you live in the East Coast, you're, you, know, you might ride a public transportation all the time to get from point A to point B. So. And if you're a high school student, you would be riding the city bus because we don't provide uh, buses for high school students. So they would definitely know. And fortunately, so many of our kids are in neighborhood schools because we've really gone to the shift of trying to get students in their neighborhood. For those students, a lot of them are walkers. A lot of them, you know, ride their bikes. Uh, that also does exist. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Robbins, did you want to add to any of the answers that I just shared related to Metro or anything else? I think you covered it well, uh, Dr. Anderson. You know, I guess the only other thing that I will add is that we're uh, continuing to monitor the actual ridership that we are experiencing. Uh, you know, we're very early in this process, so uh, we are a bit hesitant to adjust any routes or add any additional students that may be uh, situated less than that two mile barrier. Uh, without knowing uh, before the smoke settles just what is actually being used of the capacity that is available. Uh, one of the things that Kansas Central has shared with us that they have learned 
uh, up to this point across their network uh, here in the United States is that as parents have become more comfortable with the safety uh, precautions that are being taken in schools, that they have found that their ridership after a four or five week period has increased in some of these other locations anywhere from 35 to 45% as parents are letting their kids go back to this on-site uh, learning. So we don't know whether or not we're going to experience that same uptick uh, or whether or not we're gonna have some of the numbers that we're currently experiencing. Uh, this uh, weekend, I know that our bus drivers this past week, they have been filling out attendance sheets. Uh, the management uh, here in Topeka, they're going to review those attendance sheets and see just how many students of those that were routed to ride are actually riding. Uh, so, you know, we're gonna uh, really monitor this. And if we see that there is an opportunity because of reduced ridership, that we can reduce that two mile uh, distance, that two mile limit uh, down to uh, a mile and a half or something in between, whatever adjustment that we can make uh, so that we can capture more uh, students that may be in uh, need of uh, transportation, we are certainly going to do that. We are just hesitant about doing that too soon and doing that already when we're just a week or two into the uh, transportation process. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Mr. Hare would like to make a couple of comments. I think we have some background there. Mr. Hare is on, so we're going to pull him on up, and he's still with us uh, to talk about any, uh, not only as the uh, association president and for National Principals Month, but to talk about any of the upcoming changes, just as a reminder for those that aren't aware, as well as the bus, as well as Boys and Girls Club. So as we talk about transportation, he happens to have all of those in place. You know, one of the things I'll say when we address this uh, adjustment, uh, you know, this adjustment is really connecting with students and staff and others uh, about remote learning and having kids engaged as well as with our commissioner of education and really wanting students in five days a week. We're able to do it at elementary, several of our high schools, Cap City, Hope Street and other places, but we haven't been able to do it everywhere. But what we do know is the academic and social emotional needs are significant. So if we can be a touchstone each day, give kids opportunity each day, have a flex day for Wednesday for small groups, we wanna do that. So we know the survey from staff uh, from parents. So with our district model saying that we're going to proceed forward and, uh, and um, at this point transportation would not be guaranteed but based on the survey data and based on what we know are needs for kids, principals uh, always connect with families to see what they need. So even if you weren't a bus rider and you said I live at the mission or something <laughs> and I need some help, that's something that principals tend to do. They get to know their families, they help problem solve. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. here about uh, talking about uh, your uh, creativity as it relates to uh, bus issues. We'll address it at a district level, but primarily as principals are getting to know our, their families, they're addressing it uh, successfully in their spaces. Uh, Mr. Hare, can you talk a little bit about the transportation as well as mention the uh, Boys and Girls Club and anything else about the new model since you've spoken with your staff about the new model and your thoughts about that or as well as your staffs? Right. Um, you know, just specifically with busing, um, we, we haven't had a whole lot of kickback about busing right now. We do have a few few parents that need some assistance and things like that. Like Dr. Anderson said, we are reaching out, talking with parents, coming up with some solutions. And one of the solutions that uh, came up today is uh, Boys and Girls Club uh, met with me on the phone today. And uh, they are offering um, service for families. They've stepped up every year with some sort of different program for our kids. And one of that is um, that th they're going to be bringing kids to school midday. So they were calling to see what time we would like those kids there so they could provide that opportunity. And also at the end of the day, what time to pick up kids for their programs. And in the off time, like the morning time when those kids, um, they, they're opening up their doors for opportunities for supervision for middle school kids. They come in, they provide homework support. And they also provide meals and things like that. And then the same thing for those B or those A kids in the afternoon, um, they're going to come and pick up kids who are in their programs and uh, take them back to Boys and Girls Club, provide supervision, opportunities for kids to get educational support and help on homework, and just uh, provide opportunities for families. And uh, and la I mean, last year I don't know about fees or anything. Last year they 
came and got kids from our school every night. Um, Busing included, meals were included, snacks included, and it was like a $20 application fee for the whole entire year, which is huge. And I know that uh, there's probably, you know, reduced or little fees or no fees at all for programs like this. So that is one option for parents for both supervision and for transportation at this time and for some educational support. Um, and then we talk about, you know, the new model and hopefully everyone is, is uh, kind of grasping that in their head, what that looks like. But uh, we are super excited about the, the new model. And uh, actually I had the middle schools from in our county reach out today to me asking for our model because they would like to mimic something for it as well. Um, but we, you know, we're looking for, um, you know, two key things I think is what's gonna come out of this new model and it's more direct instruction for kids. I know it sounds like there's going to be less when you have half a day but actually the increased direct instruction with kids in the classroom plus progress monitoring, actually being able to see where our kids are more frequently, more often, daily during the week, and being able to offer those two things, which is you know what teaching and learning is about, um, I think we're pretty excited about. And staff is super excited as well um, because they're going to have uh, you know more kids in the classroom. They're gonna be able to you know hold kids accountable and also, have more time for some real deep instruction with um, kids. So um, if there's things that you'd like me to answer or Dr. Anderson, some things you'd like me to touch on, please uh, don't hesitate to call on me. Uh, Dr. Bonebrake. You've done an awful lot of research into solutions for the transportation. And I understand there's four routes. Couldn't you make it three routes? There's one in the morning with that bus take students home and also pick students up to go to the schools. Couldn't they do the same thing with social distancing since they're dropping off? They're also picking up. Mr. Robbins question. Actually, three routes couldn't actually happen the way uh, our buses run. But Mr. Robbins, can you address that? I understood uh, Dr. Bonebreak uh, properly. Uh, what we are being told is that, particularly in the midday, there is not enough turnaround time to take and drop students off and then pick up students to get them back to school to begin their afternoon session. So basically, you're running routes that overlap there are buses that are transporting students home while at the same time buses have picked up students to transport them to the school. You could Why wouldn't one bus do that? You drop a kid off, you pick up another, you drop one off, you pick up another, just be one bus, one route. Uh, it's not as simple as that when we are running and crisscrossing routes to provide transportation to six different middle schools. And you're transporting kids from all over our district. And so we have approximately, if I say this wrong, let me know, approximately 80 routes. Is that about right, Mr. Robbins? Somewhere between 80 and 90 routes? Yes, we run 79, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And so that approximate 80 routes um, and the middle school buses do actually serve the elementary, you know, so they, they actually do what you've shared uh, because the turnaround time is such. In this case, to get as much instructional time in, kids come in the morning um, and, uh, and then they have their lunch. Uh, the buses will drop kids off at the middle school, then they will go and run the routes for elementary. So they're running routes for elementary while um, the students are staying at school when they leave uh, in the uh, morning or just before the afternoon and go home, um, then the other bus should be picking up the other students because while students are boarding, students are coming. Uh, so you would need two uh, separate groups. Uh, at the end of the day, the bus company did share that they only have um, an approximate number of buses, which is about 20 or so buses. They could run maybe 20 bus routes. Uh, as opposed to the 80. So we also know that um, with the number of buses that they have available, uh, we need to make sure that we commit to what they know they can fill. That's keeping in mind quarantines and COVID and all the other things that they're factoring in in terms of staff uh, changes over the course of the year. 
Uh, so we are doing what we can with what we have um, in that regard as it relates to the buses with Mr. Robbins and the transportation team looking every way they can to serve as many kids as we can. Are there other questions for Mr. Hare or Mr. Robbins? My first question is for Mr. Robbins. So in summation, we have transfer, or we will have transportation for A students in the morning um, to school, but not transportation back home. And then for B students, transportation to school in the afternoon and transportation back home. Is that, that correct? Yes, ma'am, that's correct. Okay, thank you. And then for our A students who have a hardship or have some other situation like the dual language students, then we will be able to provide transportation for those A students back home at 11 o'clock. Correct? We will not have established routes for A students. Uh huh. Okay. So there, there won't be any uh, permanent transportation that is arranged for A students. Okay, so I, I thought I heard that students who attend, don't attend their local or their, their middle school attendance area, like our mm -hmm. dual language students or just kids who don't, who don't live near their middle school. Um, I thought I heard that those students will have, those A students will have transportation back home here in a few weeks. So students will have transportation. Now yes. the group that they're in may be adjusted to be a B group and many are in a B group. Uh, that is the difference in that regard because the B transportation is being provided. I, I'll ask if Dr. Kip is on the line. If he is on the line, we'll pull him on up. One of the things we did, we met with all the middle schools and he shared, here are your students and many of them fall into the B category. It just fell nicely that way, many of our schools. And so here are, the, here are your buses, here's who's B already, here's who's A. Are there any adjustments that we need to make to make sure that the students who need to ride in the afternoon have that transportation provided? Uh, and in some cases, uh, Again, like the newcomers, which Mr. Hare happens to have that as well, uh, they're maintaining them all day at their building, as are all middle schools. Uh, Dr. Kip, oh, you are on the line. It's uh, so, Dr. Kip, I uh, will uh, turn it over to you to, uh, if I need to, either if I misstated uh, or you need to add to what I've shared related to busing in the A B group and what um, information you sent to Mr. Robbins as it relates to that. Yes. Uh Basically, this uh, unraveling this Gordian knot is really uh, a matter of looking at the granular data at each and every single kid. Uh, we pulled uh, every kid that has a route currently, and we split it up by the group A, group B. We shared that with each middle school for them to kind of analyze and look to see what their balance was. And we kind of turned that over to the middle school principals to uh, evaluate like uh, whether a, a, ch a change needs to occur, you know, if, if we need to move a kid from A to B. And so, as Dr. Anderson mentioned earlier, there were some situations like Robinson, uh, Eisenhower, there's very few kids riding the bus. And so, uh, again, we did send out that survey yesterday to ask every single parent that is riding right now, uh, the degree of hardship, you know, if, if this is a hardship kind of situation, and we'll evaluate each and every single case um, as we get that data back in. The other survey was also specifically to dual language to ask if they have a hardship. So that also allowed, and that, that was the survey where several came back initially that they had no hardship in for Landon specifically. Uh, but with that, um, you know, of course, as the ones that came in that said they have a hardship or they live quite the distance over two miles away, um, then those are the names that Mr. Uh, uh, that Mr. Robbins received from Dr. Kip related to those particular students. Um, so he has that number, and but they might be in the B group. Many of those were in the B group already, and uh, they might have been moved to the B group if they weren't already or um, asked if they 
I had other transportation already. Okay, so I just want to remind people that not all of our parents um, have email or use email. So as, as useful as that survey is, it's, it's not useful for our parents who don't have email. So, um, so am I, if a student is in group A and does not have a ride home, then Will that student will be changed to group B, or there might be a way to get this A student home, like from, from Landon and back to the Oakland area? Since you're talking about Landon, I'll just ask Ms. Schreiner to answer that. And do know that principals are calling all their families, and Ms. Schreiner called today, I think, with an interpreter, but for some of her dual language, but they're all taking that list and calling families. That's why they're giving the hardship. Because we know even when you have email, if you're like me, you might not even check it as often as you need to. Something might go in spam. You might, you might have just been busy working. Uh, so they are actually calling as well, just like we well, do with the well. attendance checks. We call from that. I'm going to ask Ms. Schreiner um, just to address her attendance. And I don't know if you heard the question uh, in terms of uh, your dual language students and, and how you're addressing your AB group with getting students home uh, and any examples of you know, how you're addressing that piece overall. She jumped back on quickly. You could see her running through the house with her computer <laughs> only during COVID. <laughs> oh, Ms. Schreiner. I, I apologize. The lighting's not very great. Hello, That's everybody. Fine. And so oh. we're talking about transportation. And so we're going to turn it over to you to share a little bit about, you know, your dual language kids and how you're uh, supporting them with transportation and even your uh, non-English speaking students, how you're addressing that and, and even communicating with them. Absolutely. So um, I, I've had multiple ways of communicating with them. Um, uh, we have done a lot of communicating through uh, emails and things like that. But the parent, I've had several that have reached out to me. Um, I have a really wonderful staff that's able to assist with the translating. And by the way, I took my first Spanish class the other night. So I'm really excited about that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm uh, on my road to learning and, and becoming a Spanish speaker. Um, but also um, board member Melanie Stewart Campbell has been assisting me because several of my dual language parents have reached out to her. And so she and I have been working as a team and uh, addressing some of the concerns. Um, I would say that one of the things that we've tried to do is I've tried to ensure that all of them are checking their email to um, fill out the survey that the district has recently sent out so that we can find out who has hardships and make sure that we are um, able to assist them. Uh, some of the things that I've offered at my school I have a parent that's going to um, uh, allow me to keep their student full days a couple, two days a week. Um, and we're going to put him in a study hall kind of setting and or allow him to even attend his classes twice a day um, so that they can continue to work and, and not have to worry about getting him home during the day. Um, uh, we, you know, we've talked about that. I, I've explained that the district is working very, very hard to um, do what they can. And, and in the meantime, and if that doesn't come about, then we're going to support them in whatever way we can. So um, offering some extended hours that the students can stay, um, allowing them to arrive earlier than they would have otherwise. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do that for all of my students, but especially those because they travel from farther across town than, than my students that are in my area, obviously. Thank you, Ms. Schreiner. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, there's not going to be any model that's 100% perfect. This is about Absolutely. getting to know your families, personalizing, and letting every principal um, do that in ways they know best. Uh, as a district, to think that for 13,000, uh, uh, you know, uh, a little bit above 13,000 students that we'll be able to do that, uh, that uh, we don't know every single one of those 13,000, but our principals do. So this has become a relationship builder and uh, the needs that they have, which range from Boys and Girls Club to at one school to a student staying all day at another school. So when you say, is it this way or that way? Well, it's not one full district model. This is about serving the whole child and trying to wrap our arms around whatever their needs are. And they may be different. So I'm, I'm so glad that you could jump on to hear two different examples. Thank you, Ms. Schreiner. Absolutely. I'm sorry I wasn't here when you asked. <laughs> oh, you were here. We didn't even know until you said that. <laughs> oh, oops. I, I've been here the whole time. <laughs> Other questions? Complex topics, aren't they? Okay, yeah. My second um, is for, well, Ms. Schreiner and, and Mr. Hare. So I think that 
there wasn't um, clarity, but now there is. And I just want to hear you say, so starting next week, um, A students in the morning, and then in the afternoon, A students are not Zooming in, correct? So teacher is not teaching half the, the kids, you know, in person, and then like going over and trying to like teach the other half remotely. Is that correct? Right, and I can speak on behalf of middle school. <clears throat> So my, my particular building, each building is doing it just a little bit different depending on their staff, but in my particular building, um, all of my full remote kids, because I do still have about 110 kids who are choosing full remote, so they're all going to remote in the morning along with the A kids, and so teachers are going to do those groups together, and then in the afternoon, they're just going to have B kids in the room, and there's going to be no remoting in the afternoon. Now with that said, um, you know, there could be some possibility. Some, some teachers are asking um, a kid to come back in the afternoon and go ahead and let a kid Zoom if they need like a double dose of something. And so we're being creative in the ways that we do that. But traditionally right now, at least for Jardine, we're doing all Zoom kids in the morning because that also provides structure for kids and routines and things like that. And then we're looking at those off times as those traditional times of doing some independent practice, doing projects, extension of learning. Um, also, we're doing some different flip flip classrooms and like our science classrooms are doing like lots of, lots of project based stuff and they're doing some hands on things and in order to do that their the kids homework that they may do on the off time may be a flip classroom where they're watching a flip grid video the teacher created just to provide some foundational skills and information to help them be successful the next day so we're doing things creatively um, we're trying to encourage we're trying to make kids be um, academically fatigued rather than screen time fatigue and that's kind of an issue that's going on right now is, I mean, it's a lot of time, even if we're in our current instructional model, but we're gonna hit hard with those 45 minutes um, for our classes and uh, make them academically fatigued rather than, like I said, screen fatigue, because there is a difference. We want, we want our kids fresh and we want as much learning as possible and this model is doing that for us. And it's also helping out teachers and teachers are gonna be their best all day long with this as well. Ms. Schreiner, is that how it looks at your building or do you want to uh, make any adjustments to those comments? Uh, he really kind of spoke on behalf of middle, but are there any uh, adjustments since each building is a little bit, uh, a little bit different? Mine is very similar. We're doing the same thing. We're Zooming in the morning and teachers have the opportunity if they want to invite someone back in the afternoon, they are absolutely free to do that. We're also going to use that as an intervention time. We are you know, lucky enough to have a reading interventionist and she's going to use that time to be able to pull kids into small groups via Zoom um, to give some extra intervention uh, in addition to, you know, the, giving them the time to work on their projects or their homework and do their independent practice. But we're also going to use that as an intervention time and a time to give some, you know, during the day tutoring when that's more convenient, hopefully for kids, um, as well as, you um, giving them time away from the screen as well. But we're, we're gonna try to use it to catch all the things that we're not able to do when we're teaching you know, full time during the day with those kids. We can't pull them out of another class necessarily. And so now they're not in a class so I can pull them when I need to. So it, it affords us that time as well. Thank you. Are there other questions? I love when the principals are here because you hear practical boots from the ground, what it really actually looks like. It's, it's great. I would like Sorry. to say one of the, and I, I just like to say one of the things that I think is, you know, I always try to tell my staff about the, the things that are they're learning and how they are stronger. And, you know, I have some teachers who've never used, they don't, they're, they're older like me <laughs> and technology is not their best friend and they are embracing it and they're learning. And one of the things that I've seen happening during this three weeks of, of Zoom time is kids who never speak up are advocating for themselves. You know, when they, when they have a technology issue, they're emailing, they're emailing me, they're emailing their teachers, they're, they're asking for help, they're calling our, you know, our TA at our school, and they are learning not only the academic skills, but also life skills. They're learning how to advocate and how to speak up and get what they need when they need it. And we're encouraging that because I think that's a valuable life skill. And so that's something I think that's positively coming out of the challenges that we face every day. They're they're learning a lot through those challenges. And I, I mean, I, I find that to be a very positive thing as well. What are you doing? Yes, thank you. Okay, so just to make sure I understand, group A students, um, teacher is Zooming 
with the remote only, the, the kids who've opted for remote only, but that's, that's in the morning with the A students who are physically there, right? right. Okay, and then, so A students, when they go home in the afternoon, um, they're not zooming in, they're doing extension, they're just, they're, they're working like on their own independently. And then same with the B students, B students are home working independently in the morning, and then they're there in person in the afternoon, but no one's zooming in, correct? Right. Okay. By, 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 at least at Jardine, that's how it is, and it's, gonna, it's pretty standard, um, although each school kind of has their own creative um, things with that, um, depending on each school and their needs and things like that. Um, and then we also have Wednesdays, which all kids will Zoom Wednesday, I and mean, we're keeping that right now. Um, we're also running our social emotional curriculum through Wednesdays. We're doing Naviance on Wednesdays, and we're really hitting Wednesdays hard with um, interventions, small groups. Um, on Zoom, there's breakout sessions, so we have paras and teachers and all sorts going into breakout rooms with kids, providing some one-on-one -on -one, um, intervention as well. We also um, have, you know, we're getting some tutoring up and running. We're going to have some on-site tutoring, and for Jardine, we are looking at having some evening tutoring, and it's evening by Zoom, so some staff will be available in the evenings that teach the kids and their parents can Zoom in and get some assistance in the evening um, when they're all together. And so we're looking at lots of different ways to support kids. And as mentioned, we also have C kids. I mean, I have 20 kids right now that are coming all day long um, because of some needs that they have. And uh, we mentioned earlier, my newcomers are coming all day long, five days a week, um, because we're trying to hit language skills and technology skills for our kids who have never had a computer before. So we're um, providing some you know, enhanced opportunities for them um, to make sure that we are equitable for all of our kids. Thank you so much for answering all my questions. I've, I've seen amazing things that teachers have been doing with the in-person and remote, and it's just nothing short of, of amazing. So thank you. The other thing that we can utilize is the district has purchased many, uh, many wonderful resources for our staff that they can differentiate. Uh, one of those programs is Moby Max and my teachers are using it um, really well to differentiate for different levels of learning in their class and those can be used independently assigned for the afternoons as well, things like that. So um, the teachers are very appreciative of all the resources that have been purchased by the district for them to utilize during this time because um, that's making a significant difference as well. I think there's another question. So all of our children are getting the 1160 hours of instruction. And Ms. Wallace will address that from curriculum uh, and instruction. So yes, um, we have 360 minutes of instruction daily and that has not changed. That's the same as it was last year and the year before. Um, so it really is instruction um, with their teacher for half of the day and the other half of the day is spent in independent activities and projects and assignments. So it is the same number of minutes of instruction. 360 minutes is six hours. Yes. When you um, look at the number of minutes of instruction, you deduct things like lunch and recess and some of those things. So it is 360 minutes or six hours of instruction a day. Are there other questions for the team? Mrs. Boy. So I'm wondering if our high school looks the same as our middle school as has been explained to us on instruction. Does it look the same? Okay, now let's see if Miss Morrissey is on and if she's going to run through her house and jump on. <laughs> so uh, is Miss uh, Morrissey, can you pull her up if she's online with us at this time? Do you see Miss Morrissey? All right, so we, uh, and we'll ask her to just join us. Uh, and I'm not sure, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, any one of the high school principals. Uh, so uh, we'll uh, ask her to go ahead and join us. And I know Mr. Kathy is at a football game. Thank you very much, board members. Uh, so I know he's not on this evening. And I believe Mr. Mr. Buckendorf has already left for the evening as well. Uh, but with that, and, and being that's 
Topeka High is the largest school. It'd be great for her to kind of speak to that. And we'll also ask Mr. Buckendorf if he can jump back on if that's possible. Uh, I'd rather you hear it directly from the principal uh, as opposed to uh, hearing it uh, from me about what this will and should look like. Um, and so as we get those people on, uh, outside of that, are there other questions that you have? Yeah, I think the feedback we got from surveys is that it online is really tough for the students and really tough for the parents to give them the support. I, I know myself, I've, I've, it's tough. It, it's just hard all around for individuals. And so I, I don't have any doubt that uh, this change is going to help students so much to, to be able to connect. I mean, the dynamic um, between being at home with your parents and trying to get your work done as opposed to teachers, it's just, it's just different. And I think students respond to that. And I think teachers as well, right? They, I mean, I can see the, the faces of, of parent, or teachers on, as they're trying to get their kids together, but online, and it's just not the same as in person. So I think, I think it's a, a great uh, move in uh, and, and any great system you're going to make adjustments right and I think that's what we're seeing here M my my only struggle and I, I think I we've heard it from from parents and I imagine teachers also feel is it just felt like it was a very quick turnaround that we, ha we got the feedback and then we had a really uh, uh, quick adjustment and I just I, I worry about uh, in the future I can imagine we may need more changes just because we always want to make sure that we're we're in tune with what's going on and if there are adjustments that need to be made we should be making those my only issue is just it, the sense that it was really quick turnaround and a lot of people felt caught off guard and so i just want to maybe you could help me sort of understand you i'm so glad you asked that the why behind the what um well students come back monday so we had the conversation with principals who when they made their schedules and actually miss morrissey actually is on now uh, but you know we talked with principals about um, do we want to start the students in on one way now that we hear feedback that the first few weeks uh, there is screen time fatigue and there are issues and and there are significant concerns so do we want to allow those concerns to continue through October because the new quarter would start in November or because students come back on Monday um, you know that gives us a couple of weeks uh, to uh, really look at, you know, principals working together, creating a schedule, and I actually, the principals are on the line. Mr. Hare was one of those working with Ms. Hoffman over a weekend and one evening. He actually helped create the middle school schedule. Um, so as the principals made the schedule, Ms. Morrissey really led that piece uh, for the high schools. Um, and then I asked them all to check in with their teachers to see if this is a schedule that they felt uh, would work and, and check in with uh, individual teachers and uh, and if this is something we should proceed with in uh, October. So students would start with one schedule. I think across the board, uh, rather than having them start in one way that we already know isn't working well, it's causing more people to be disengaged and then changing two weeks later after they started school, felt like would be an interruption that would not be a good one to make. Uh, therefore, if we're going to change, the request was let's have them come in with however it's going to be. We did something similar to micro schools. Remember, we didn't know a lot about micro schools and classrooms until the research started coming out about how effective they were. So we were preparing to start elementary one way. We saw that research and we put it in place. And as you heard from Ms. Johnson, it's one of the best changes we've made and we really haven't had issues in our elementary. Uh, and they've been in for weeks uh, without any significant issues at all. So. Um, we uh, thank the board for the grace because there might be times where we something significant happens and we have to be responsive to that. We'll communicate as much as we can and really do it through the principals primarily because that we've learned works better than just through the district. Uh, but that would be the why behind the what just because they start Monday. If they had started next Monday, they would have had the feedback even before then. The only other piece we added into that feedback before we rolled it out to parents because we could have done that a week earlier potentially however we wanted to get feedback from teachers so the principals really wanted to wait to Tuesday at three o'clock at the same time to share the final schedule the feedback sessions with several of their teachers happened the week prior Thursday Friday Monday uh, just to continue to listen to those thoughts 
So in order to implement it quickly, that was the main reason, the starting date. Ms. Morrissey, can you share a little bit about your schedule? So the middle school talked about what it looks like on Monday, and uh, you're the largest school, so you're the lucky one. And uh, Mr. Kathy is on, and he sent the message at, from the football game. In fact, maybe we'll start with Mr. Kathy, because we know they're probably winning that football game. And Mr. Kathy, do you want to share what it looks like at your building? It's really the same uh, pretty much across the high schools. But what does Monday look like? If you could briefly share that, then we'll turn it over to Ms. Morrissey. All right, yeah, definitely. Uh, Monday, we're going to have uh, our two A, A and B groups coming in. Our A group will come in the morning, um, and we will be – uh, taking temperatures, getting them into class, serving breakfast uh, for our A group. And then they'll be running through their odd classes on Monday, even classes on Tuesday. And, you know, A group in the morning, then we're going to have about a 45 minute window between the end of lunch and the time that our next class, set of classes start to get lunch served, uh, rooms disinfected, um, and, and restrooms and everything. Make sure we run through those real good before our second group of students come in. And then we'll run through those till uh, afternoon classes till three o'clock. I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Morrissey and then open it up for questions for the high school. And what's the score, Mr. Kathy? Well, it might not be very high. Uh, we'll turn it over to Ms. Morrissey. Oh, Ms. Morrissey hasn't logged back in yet. Hey, we are, uh, it is not pretty. We're down a little bit right now, but oh, we're we'll halftime. So players are playing hard. We're looking good. Um, it's just a hard fought game. All right, and, and just down a little bit is all we needed to hear. So we'll, we'll uh, be cheering you on from here. Ms. Morrissey is having some technical difficulty with entering. However, all the high schools have the same schedule. That she's gonna say the same A, B, uh, odd, even uh, dates. Any questions for Mr. Kathy about high school? And the minutes Ms. Wallace mentioned would be the same as well for high school, that doesn't change. And the high school teachers won't have uh, be doing remote and classroom as well does it look like the middle school as well that's now that's tailored to the school miss Wallace. unless you want to speak to that mr kathy can you share in terms of remote how do remote students uh, uh go to school do they have a certain time or day or uh or are they doing it uh zooming in all at the same time so our, our fully remote students that are full-time students that do not go to washburn tech or tcal We'll go attend classes in the afternoon session. And then our, um, our kids that go to TCAL or Washburn Tech in the afternoon in person, then they will be attending uh, class via Zoom in the morning session. Uh, but we wanted the larger Zoom sessions to be in the afternoon so the teachers had a chance to go through their lesson and be prepared to uh, kind of be able to answer questions, predict what questions may come from students. So they had that anticipatory set of questions for students. So the in-person students in the A group in the morning and the Zooming in in the afternoon, as he's mentioned. And Mr. Kathy created a study hall space for students who also want to do study work and wait until they go to their TCALC or other classes. So he has some students there all day as well. Other questions for Mr. Kathy? Right, thank you, thank you, Mr. Kathy. Uh, we can go back to your game. All right, thank you very much. Have a good evening. All right, have a good evening as well. Are there other questions that uh, any of you have? Mrs. Bully. So this doesn't have a um, direct instructional question, but I know that I keep hearing all night about sanitizing things in between use of classrooms and instruments, and I'm thinking of preschool and their uh, baskets have to be sanitized, I think every few days. Are we finding a better way to do that than just scrub down every little piece and put it back in the basket when I'm thinking of preschool? Or how much time does it take to sanitize our instruments before you head into another classroom and do our teachers? Are they having a, a fair amount of time to do that or well, um, it's really hard. Mr. Roberts will answer this. It's been interesting, the new, unless Mr. Hare wants to jump in, the new things that have come out and I think Topeka Public Schools has 
Um, many of the uh, newer uh, pieces of equipment, I think you've also seen a safety uh, presentation, so he can share what those are, because even the um, preschool with the instruments, or they just lay them out, you turn on the fogger or the you know, UV light, and those items are laid out, and that allows for that disinfecting as one of the items. But Mr. Robbins, do you want to just uh, briefly highlight the two or three main uh, items that you'd like to related to how rooms are being cleaned so teachers aren't having to scrub each individual toy uh, as an example. And I think you might still be on mute. You know, we, we have the uh, normal cleaning process. Every uh, classroom has the uh, spray bottles and the uh, microcloths that they're using to wipe down. Uh, I think uh, Ms. Boley, you've had a chance to see uh, much of the new equipment cleaning and disinfecting equipment that we have purchased and are using. Our hand sprayers, uh, our battery charge hand sprayers that we're using, uh, that is a quick uh, cleaning method uh, that does not leave any residue at all uh, on any of the surfaces that it is sprayed on. Uh, we've had to kind of modify the use of the foggers because we found out that it puts out such a, uh, dense mist that it was setting off our uh, uh, smoke alarms. Uh, so we have moved the foggers to the larger spaces like uh, our cafeterias and uh, media centers and that sort of thing. Uh, the UV lighting, we have those for each and every classroom. Uh, those are to uh, kill any uh, virus or anything that may exist on a surface uh, and it does it quickly and does it cleanly uh, and uh, without any uh, muscle that is required. Uh, just plug it in, you let it run for an hour and uh, that UV lighting and, and the rays, you know, it kills uh, any sort of uh, virus or infestation that may exist uh, in that area. Um, the instruments, uh, I think that, um, you know, I, I don't know as much about what is happening on the part of the uh, instructors as far as how the instruments are being addressed. Uh, but, you know, the staff is handling, uh, you know, like baskets uh, at the preschool level. Uh, our custodial staff uh, is not as involved in that sort of cleaning, uh, but we feel that we have a good process in place, uh, the necessary equipment and supplies to make sure that we are providing a very clean uh, and safe environment for our students and our staff. Are there other questions for us? Thank you, Mr. Robbins. Mrs. Bowie. Um, this isn't a question, but I just wanted to have a comment that our UV lights, we had a problem getting them in and getting them shipped. And a big shout out to all of our staff that got those out to every single building and were ready by Monday. And that was uh, a, from a, just an incredible feat that our district accomplished. And I know. Mr. Robbins was a piece of getting that done. So I wanted to say thank you for putting all these layers in place that are keeping everyone so safe. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Bowley. You know, there's a number of people that have been involved uh, in acquiring not only UV lighting, but uh, a lot of the equipment that I just mentioned. Uh, you know, uh, shout out goes to our purchasing department and uh, Ms. Dina Merriman. Uh, our, our service department, uh, Rob Seitz and Matt Caleb. Uh, Matt Caleb was instrumental in putting together a, a training session uh, so that as soon as we received that UV lighting, uh, we had a rep that came in from the supplier uh, that was on site to provide training for our custodial staff to make sure that they uh, understood the proper use of the UV lighting and uh, the safe use of the UV lighting so that we could accomplish the cleaning that was necessary but do it in the most uh, safe manner uh, as possible. Uh, so it's, it's been a truly a team effort 
Uh, I will also uh, uh, speak highly of the uh, supplier uh, because of the delay that we had in receiving uh, our supplies since they were shipped from overseas and they got held up in customs for a few days. I uh, decided to make uh, a personal appearance here to provide the training. Uh, and on top of that, uh, he was so happy with uh, the way that he was treated and the response that he received from the team here at Topeka Public Schools that he has ordered uh, and is shipping an additional 50 uh, units of the UV lighting to us at no charge uh, so that we have some backup units uh, if we need them. So, uh, uh, like I said, a team effort and uh, uh, the uh, commendation uh, goes to uh, a number of people uh, to make this happen for our staff and our kids. A lot of information tonight. I'll know a lot more in two weeks too, won't we? Any other questions? Concerns? I don't see any, so we'll move on to uh, board member comments. Dr. Bonebreak. I just hope with all these pressures reporting on the teachers and administration, we don't see any burnout. I think that would be almost imminent. Uh, and also kudos to Dr. Anderson. I think, aren't you nominated for superintendent of the year for Kansas? I am one of the four finalists. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bonebreak. We appreciate everything you've done. Thank you very much. Dr. Morrison. Yeah, I don't have much to say except for um, Kudos to the um, fine arts department. Um, that's uh, what they did is amazing. I, I, I happen to know how much research that was involved because um, Topeka Symphony um, Maestro has done all that research and Chris Reynolds um, came up with all the same things that, that uh, uh, Dr. Wy uh, Kyle Wiley Pickett uh, is instituting for a symphony concert, which is this Saturday. And that's amazing at this time uh, with all COVID that we're able to do these things and stay safe at the same time. So kudos to them. Mr. Munoz. First of all, I wanna um, again recognize uh, you hear Romo Ruiz on his uh, recognition as a senior of the month. Uh, Next, um, principals, I think we, we've all seen and heard for ourselves just how much work goes into um, being, uh, you know, organizing uh, each individual school and of, of which we have many, many schools within our school district. So it is a, a tall order and we have individuals who are step, you know, filling, you know, these, uh, these large, you know, what's being asked of them. And so thank you to them. And, and uh, I'm going to make a, it a, uh, a project of mine to reach out to every one of our principals during this month. And one, to make sure that they are, they know that we care about what they do and that we think that they're, they're valued. Uh, and then two, to begin to sort of establish those relationships, because as, as Dr. Anderson said, that they really do know what's going on in our schools intimately, and that they, they are developing these relationships with our families. And so that's really important work. So we want, to, want them to know that we, we value them very greatly. Um, last, what I would say is uh, that, uh, you know, we are hearing uh, struggles that our, our families are, are going through and, and our students. And, and I think uh, there are a lot of bumps, and, and for any parent who is listening, uh, if you are struggling through some things, to reach out with your principal. So that's, that's where everything starts, and I think we've heard today that uh, all of our principals are willing to try and, and find some solution. There, there is no, you know, there's no perfect uh, thing that we can come up with, but I think this, every, every change is something, is a better version of what we had before, and so we have a number of experienced and highly talented individuals in our schools and our administration who are making the, the best of what we have to work with. And so please, if you are uh, struggling, 
speak up and, and reach out to your principals. Let them know what's going on with you. And I know that they're going to be willing to bend over backwards to try and make sure that your student um, has, you know, has what they need. And because ultimately, all of this work, all of the struggles for those students, make sure that we can give them the best opportunity despite the circumstances we find ourselves in. So um, other than that, uh, I think that's it. Thank you for those comments, Mr. Munoz. Mrs. Bully. Well, Dr. Anderson, I think you have uh, earned the superintendent of the year. <laughs> and if you don't happen to win it, which would be a surprise to me, you definitely have earned it in our district. And we appreciate everything that you have led and all the people underneath you. I know I say that every week, but every week I'm blown away by what we're putting in place. Um, we want to say that it might not be the last time we pivot um, this school year. And we appreciate the patience of, of parents and of teachers. We're, we're navigating waters that we've never had before. And so we hope we can keep it a steady boat going forward, but that may not happen. And so we ask for your patience and your grace. Um, and to learn that the Boys and Girls Club has stepped up like they have for us, what, what a gift. Our whole community has been such a gift to us. We saw the donations in our, in our board agenda and Boys and Girls Club. Thank you so much for doing that. I wish we could make you all happy. Uh, I've been in several buildings this last week. People are just amazing. Our, our TPS family is amazing. And I told many of them, I wish I had a magic wand and that we could change what's happening. But we appreciate them coming along on this journey, this adventure, and that we hope that uh, it will all come out very well. And we're already hearing so many positives. So thank you to the TPS family. We appreciate you so much. Thank you for those comments, Mrs. Bowling. Mrs. Stuart Campbell. This uh, pandemic education has demanded that, that educators and staff go beyond the, the beyond that they were already going. And I just can't thank them enough. There's, there aren't enough thanks in in any language so that's all thank you just, um, just briefly uh reminded of what our student of the month from highland park spoke about adaptability and the, how he was learning that and uh, as we uh, our students are learning we're learning our parents and students are and administrators are learning how to be adaptable so that's a good trait to learn and carry on throughout our lives so I'm appreciative of all the work that's been done to put this plan in place. Um, I know everybody's worked over time to get, make it happen. So I um, look forward to a good Monday when our students in middle and high school can attend school. So with that, we'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs>